Hi everyone and welcome to the final valuation video of the Value of Everything valuation series. I'm Owen Raskovich, the founder of the Rask Group, and I'm glad you've made it this far because this is the final valuation video and my most favorite uh, valuation technique. So I'm hoping it's a little insightful and it's a bit rewarding because some of these other valuation techniques aren't, I would say, as robust as the one we're about to learn. So this is a really good tutorial and I hope you get a lot from it. If you have any questions, remember you can reach me on Twitter at Owen Rask. Just a reminder that this spreadsheet and the valuation tutorial is for educational or informational purposes only, so please don't rely on it. You can find our full list of lovely disclaimers on our website. Um, please visit that if you are unsure of what I mean by don't rely on this spreadsheet. But also remember that you can download this spreadsheet on our website and ask me any questions from there. It's at www.raskfinance.com. Okay, so discounted cash flow analysis. As you can see, I've written something here. DCF analysis, as it's commonly called, is by far the most common valuation technique used by analysts, investors, valuation experts, and even business owners. However, some people will argue that it has weaknesses and can easily spit out misleading results. That's why we've combined it with our other techniques. You'll remember we've covered all these other valuation techniques down here. You can access that on YouTube or on our website. Um, and we're going to combine them into an overall valuation for the supermarket business Woolworths Group. One thing to note, everyone, if you've been following along with our valuation videos is that I have changed this video. So in the past, I created a very popular valuation model, but I found that it wasn't up to standard. It wasn't up to scratch. So I've gone back and I've changed a few things in the valuation model to make it a bit simpler, a bit easier to understand, but also a little bit more robust. And I'll outline them short, the changes that I've made shortly. Okay, so the most important thing to remember when you're doing a DCF valuation is to think like a business owner or someone who wants to control the core business. So what do I mean by that? I mean, free cash flow, which is what we're trying to establish, is probably the most robust valuation item or line item that you can calculate simply because free cash flow tells you what's available to the business. So after you've paid your taxes, after the costs have gone out, what are you spending and what are you receiving? And that's what we base our valuation on. So when you get confused, just think which way is cash flow going? Is cash flow going away from the business or is it coming to the business? It's really important to understand because you'll come across businesses that have unique cash flow items or unique profit and loss items. And you'll be like, what the heck does this mean? Just focus on the, which way the cash flow is going and whether it's recurring or not recurring. Some businesses, for example, will make one-off acquisitions. If that affects cash flow, you've got to ask yourself, is that part of the core business or is this just a one-off item? You might want to include it in your free cash flow buildup or you might want to exclude it. This is where it's really important for you to understand what you're trying to do. And what you're trying to do is understand the cash flow of the core business. So the, the particular type of cash flow I'm focusing on in this tutorial is free cash flow to firm. It's also abbreviated to FCFF. So free cash flow to firm is used to determine how much free cash flow, go, uh, how much free cash flow debt and equity holders have available to them. So there's another type of free cash flow called free cash flow to equity. We're not doing that, but that is uses some slightly different formulas, but the, the primary difference is that that's solely used to determine the free cash flow for equity or shareholders, not debt holders as well. We're focusing on the entire company, not just one type of investor. Okay. The next section and probably the most important section of the DCF analysis is what we call the free cash flow buildup. So how do we get to free cash flow? And basically, there's a few steps to it. And the first one is we need to effectively forecast how much revenue or how much in sales these our company is going to do. So you can see here that I've taken total revenue for Woolworths from the last three years. 
and I've put that here. There's the costs of goods sold. Obviously, that's a negative because it's deducted from total revenue to get to gross profit. This is really I, I, this section here is actually really important because you, as an analyst or you as an investor, need to understand how does this company make money. So does it like like Woolworths? Does it sell um, chips and does it sell fruit and vegetables? Or are you investing in a technology company? How does it actually make money? How are you going to forecast revenue? That's really important. So from previous tutorials, you know that you'll know that Woolworths has more than just a supermarket business. It also has a drinks or liquor business. It's got supermarkets in New Zealand. It's got a big box retail business, which is a very poor business. It's got hotel businesses like pubs and clubs and that type of thing. It did have a home improvement retailing business, which was this, these big sheds called Masters and Home Timber and Hardware, which they've since sold. You can see that they're discontinued there. There's nothing else forecasted. And then obviously at head office, they have, they have costs or they incur revenue and there's, there's things there that we, need to, that we need to include. So the way I have got to this revenue up the top here, this revenue item, is I've forecast what Woolworths' revenue per segment, per operating segment. And as a reminder, you can find the segment report for any company in the annual report or 10K. You can just press Control F or Command F on your keyboard and type in segment report and it should come up in the notes of the accounting statements. You can see that Woolworths here is broken out. It's distinct segments, but some companies may only have one segment. They may have multiple segments or what have you. So obviously historical data can just be input. I've done that there. Um, and I've calculated the year over year change in, in revenue. So you can see here the Australian food and liquor business which includes um, Woolworths' supermarket business. The revenue fell 27.05% between 2015 and 2016. But then it grew, it bounced back 4.5% in 2017. Okay, so I have forecast revenue items for each individual segment here, as you can see. And what I've done is I've simply said, whatever they did last year, so in this case, this, the Australian food and liquor segment did $36.5 billion of revenue. We're going to multiply that by the forecast growth rate, which is 3%, and that's the result here. And then I just dragged the formula across until we get to the end of the forecast period. And I did that for each of the segments. And then I've taken the sum of that, which is here, and that is our total revenue at the top here. Pretty simple, right? We're just taking what it's done in the past, we're assuming some type of growth rate and we're adding that all up and then putting it at the top. This is, you know, it's, it sounds very simple. It's one of those things where it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. So you need to pay attention. You need to have some basis for forecasting revenue, obviously. I couldn't just put in 25% growth year over year for forever because obviously a supermarket, a very mature supermarket business isn't going to do that. So this is where you as an analyst and investor need to understand what's management strategy? How are they going to grow sales? And do I think it's a good idea? Is it a bad idea? How far do, did management say how quickly they can grow? Do I think they're going to grow that quick? Maybe they're not. So you, this is where you have to use your research skills, uh, read through annual reports, industry reports, etc. Okay, so moving down the income statement or the um, the very brief income statement we have here. We've got, we get to gross profit and you can see the margin there. It's quite good. Um, we've got depreciation and amortization. You'll find this in the notes to the accounting statements or the um, reconciliation between cash flow and the income statement. The best way to forecast, I think, depreciation into the future is to look at what it's done in the past. I've only used three years here, but you could go back 10 years, for example, and you could say, what's the depreciation as a percent of total assets? So you can see here that it's remained quite stable at 4.5% up to 4.6% over the recent, um, the recent financial years. But going forward, I've simply just put in, for the, for, to keep this as simple as possible, I've put in uh, 1,000 million or $1 billion of depreciation and amortization going forward. 
but a more accurate way would be to forecast total assets into the future and then to do a percentage of that. I've included EBITDA or earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization here simply as a reference point in the future. So many companies like to include EBITDA in their presentations. Um, they say it's a closer approximation of cash flow than um, profit or net income, but I don't use it for much. Um, but you can see it there. Um, we have simply, if you go into the formula, double click, we've simply taken depreciation, which I just explained, and we've added it back to EBIT. So it's a bit of a circ it's a bit of a circular logic, a bit of circular logic there, but it's just for reference. I don't actually use EBITDA in any other point throughout this valuation tutorial. So EBIT. How do we get to EBIT? You'll normally find it on the income statement, or you will find it on the income statement. This is also called operating income. But I have once again gone into the segment report and broken it down. So I didn't just want to do EBIT forecasted at the company level, I wanted to do it at each individual business. So we can see we've got some historical data there for each of the, each of the segments. You can see why they closed the uh, home improvement business. It lost $224 million in 2015. Um, some of the other businesses, looks like the hotels businesses is doing pretty well. The general merchandise, which is kind of like a, I don't even know what you'd call it, but it's, it's a big retailer like Kmart. And you can see here that it is actually losing the Kmart. The, it's, actually, it's operating profit has swung to a steep loss. Um, going forward, I've assumed that it makes a very modest profit. That may be wrong, but um, it just keeps it very simple. New Zealand supermarkets appear to be quite robust. They're producing operating profits. Um, the, the Endeavour drinks business, which was separated um, out into its own segment in 2016, um, it also does very well. In the Australian food and liquor segment, which is in its primarily its supermarkets business, you can see here that the operating profit fell off a cliff between 2015 and 2016, but then stabilised. Um, this is partly due to some separation of some business units, but also because the business's margins fell steeply. So you can see down here, I've simply taken the EBIT result and divided that by revenue which gives us the EBIT margin. And obviously margins for a supermarket are very, very important. Woolworths will sell millions of products every year and it makes a very small margin on each product. Contrast that with say a construction business which may only sell a few products or developments each year, it would presumably have a much wider profit margin. But you can see here that Woolworths 7.17% EBIT margin in the supermarkets was far too wide and eventually something had to give. So for context, Woolworths was making larger and larger profits every year because its EBIT margin was growing and so was its sales. The sales were growing modestly, but consumers eventually pushed back and said, hey, your groceries are much more expensive. And Woolworths finally uh, came to its senses and realized that it has to drop prices to remain competitive because it's losing market share. And that's what happened here. And that's why, that's a big reason why profits, uh, operating profit for that segment fell. You can see here that the, the rate at which the margin had narrowed has, has slowed. So it fell, you know, 2% that year. It um, fell only a few basis points this year between these two years. Going forward, I forecast 4.5% EBIT margins for this very important segment and then slowing to 3%. My assumption here, and it's a very simple one, is that online will become a much more, the online retailers will become a much fiercer competitor, will become much fiercer competitors rather, and margins will be forced lower. Well, what's we not have any say in that, Com competition is coming and it must get used to smaller margins or narrower margins. The drinks business, I say, remains robust at 6.3%. They have quite robust margins. Um, everyone likes beer and wine in Australia. So I've made the assumption of 6.3% margins there. New Zealand supermarkets, I've said that margins remain mostly consistent, although a similar theme could play out with online, um, online buying and online shopping, which could reduce margins. 
In general merchandise, I've said that it's, it makes a profit, but it's a very slim one at 1% or 0.5%. Hotels business remains quite robust. Um, I don't see much in the way of disruption over the forecast period, which is the coming five years. And the unallocated business, I've simply taken the average of the prior years there. Um, there's no real rhyme or reason to that. It, normally the unallocated businesses are just corporate overheads or corporate costs that are incurred as a percent of revenue. So overall, um, we've we've summed up EBIT here. Oh, sorry, I should have skipped a step. So we use these margins and we multiply the margin that I've assumed against uh, the forecast revenue. So we forecast revenue, we forecast the margin, and therefore we can get the dollar value, which is right here. And we forecast that over the period, you can see there. And then we've simply summed that up like we did with revenue. And we can take this up to the top here. And you'll see here that there's the forecast EBIT. Okay, so you can see that I have listed two places you can get EBIT. One is the segment report, one is the income statement. I've used the segment report because it provides more granular detail. And I also think there may be, it's easier to adjust going forward. Um, maybe easier to update the model the next time we have uh, a round of financial results. Okay, so once we get to EBIT, it's quite, s it, the, the rest of it's quite formulaic. So we have here free cash flow to firm, FCFF, equals EBIT multiplied by one minus the tax rate, which I've assumed to be 30%, which I got from the prior tutorials, plus depreciation, minus CapEx, minus investments in working capital. So why is there pluses? Why is there minuses? Well, why are there minuses? It's important here to remember that we're focusing on the cash flow. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. So we would have to add that back to EBIT to take us closer to cash flow. CapEx is a genuine cash outflow. So we've spent cash on capital expenditure, so we must adjust for that. And investments in working capital. The key word there is investments in. Investments. The reason being, if we're investing in working capital, which is short-term capital to say buy in inventory, um, to buy things that are going to be sold very quickly, that's a cash outflow. We have to pay for that upfront to get it in to then sell. So if we're investing cash flow in working capital, we have to adjust for that in our model. So the first one is very simple. We simply multiply EBIT by one minus the tax rate. So that adjusts for tax, which we will have to pay. There's no ifs, buts, or maybes. The only two guarantees in life are death and taxes, as the famous saying goes. So we adjust for that. And here we just add back the depreciation and amortization, which we got from above. And you can see here it's forecast out. If you want to find where to find depreciation and amortization, you can go to the income statement, you can go to the segment report if it's broken out, or you might even go to the adjustments between cash flow and profit. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Oops. You'll see here anywhere there is a little note in the, a little yellow, um, I suppose, tab in the top right corner, you can hover over that or click on it and it will have my, my notes there on each of the individual line items to make it easier for you. Okay, next we've got, um, we're subtracting investments in long-term capital spending or CapEx. This is important because CapEx is a real cost. And if we're forecasting this business many years into the future, we must be certain that the company is investing in itself to maintain its competitive position. There are some important nuances here between what's CapEx, what isn't CapEx. So it's important to remember the, we're, we're asking ourselves, what's the core business doing here? So you can see, I'm just hovering over this, this cell. It says, ask yourself, what is the company spending on long-term assets, e.g. property, plant, and equipment, which you'll find on the balance sheet, to maintain its current cash flow? Now, the best way to understand what cash it is spending on property, plant, and equipment is to go to the investing cash flow section of the cash flow statement. So that's usually the only thing that we will take from the cash flow statement. So just here in the annual report, zoom in a little bit. You can see in 2016, so this is going back a couple of years, you can see here payments for property, plant, 
and equipment property development. You can also see payments for property, plant and equipment, excluding property development, are there. Those are both genuine cash flows, so you can see them there. Um, if it was a software business, it might have a, many payments for intangible assets. Um, the important thing to understand here is the difference between what's reoccurring and what's not. Is the payment that they're making going to happen in the future? Or, or is it not? If, it's, if the, the investments that they are making are not going to happen into the future, you obviously shouldn't model for that. So an example is a company that has grown organically for many years and then some for some reason makes an acquisition. You might ask yourself, you might question, well, should I actually add that to my valuation? And probably not, because if it's only a one-off and it's you know maybe small, then you probably don't have to adjust for that as a capital expenditure. But it is important to understand the nature of the acquisition and how it's being paid for and the risks associated with that acquisition, just like you would with any company you own. So, and that's just a reminder I've, I've said here, be mindful of divestments and acquisitions um, on the divestments front. It can look like they're boosting, boosting some free cash flow metrics. So if we go back into the annual report here, you'll see that there's proceeds from the sale of property, plant and equipment. You go, so they've, they've, in 2016, they took in $722 million. So I probably wouldn't include that in my free cash flow buildup. It just doesn't, to me, that doesn't, say recurring or regular so I, I would just avoid that okay and probably the easiest way to forecast capex is as a percent of revenue some companies will explicitly say we're going to spend five percent of our revenue as capex or they might give you a dollar figure for the year ahead um, another way to forecast capex may be to take the industry approach and to say what are competitors spending as a percentage of revenue or a percentage of profit, which is less reliable, or a percentage of gross profit on their businesses. And does Woolworths spend as much as them? Or should it be spending more than them? Will it spend more than spend more than the industry average? That's for you to adjust. I've simply taken the average here. Oh, sorry, I haven't taken the average. My mistake. That's not there. It's down here. I've tracked the historical capex across each of the segments because Woolworth, Woolworths handily breaks that out for us. And then I've made some assumptions going forward. So I've said in the years ahead, it's going to spend $500 million in the supermarkets business to remain competitive. That's down from what it has spent in the past, but we must also be mindful that it has spent a lot in the past to, res to resurrect itself and to, to win back the consumer's um, following its big gouge of their pockets. So I've said that's going to slow, but maintain consistency over the forecast period. The drinks business is also going to need $100 million a year. The supermarkets business will need $200 million. And the general merchandise will need some money before they realize that it's going nowhere and the business will be sold or shuttered. Um, hotels business, you can see there I've just picked in somewhere between these three numbers and, and put it in. Uh, you might be saying to yourself, this seems very wishy-washy. Um, and to be honest with you, many of these forecasts are more faith or more art than science. And any analyst that says they aren't are probably trying to pull your leg because the reality is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. All we can do is take our best guess. Um, we can think probabilistically and we can say there's a percentage chance that this will happen, there's a percentage chance that that won't happen, there's a percentage chance that this will happen, and we can do some scenario analysis and come up with a figure. But for simplicity, I've just done some, some numbers here. Um, you can see in here, that's you, I've just put it in percentage terms versus the dollar value here. So you can see that as a percentage of sales for that segment, uh, Woolworth spent 1.83% in 2015 back in back on capex and then it increased that I'm saying that drops off and you might say to me, you might say that I'm wrong and you might disagree and that's fine you can go through and put your own figures in one of the nuances and I alluded to this earlier was is that you should be mindful of the relationship between capex and depreciation 
Obviously, if you're forecasting CapEx to grow rapidly, that means the company is going to be adding assets to its balance sheet. Therefore, it would probably have more depreciation and amortization. So those two, although they may not move in lockstep, there'll be, there'll be a relationship there that you should be mindful of. Finally, the last section of the breakdown to cash flow from EBIT to cash flow is the investments in working capital. This is probably the most confusing part of the entire process of the free cash flow buildup. So bear with me, and if what I'm about to say doesn't make a lot of sense, simply go online, read my notes here, um, or go, go online and, and look at some, there's some great videos on YouTube describing this, and I might even do one in the future, so be sure to check back in on rasfinance.com, and uh, let's be honest, I'll probably put one in just to, to round out the valuation series. But I hope that this brief explanation does it justice. Okay, so... I've said that we've got to focus on cash flow. There are two types of cash outflow that we generally have when we're running a business. There's cash that we spend for the long-term benefit of the business, aka capital expenditure. You'll know if you've done some accounting that if you spend on an asset, a big asset, generally that's not all incurred in one year. You have benefit, you have, you'll have a benefit from that over multiple years. So accountants separate non-current versus current assets. and the current assets or the assets that we're going to use within a year are generally working capital items and the assets that will be consumed over many years are capex and then depreciated over that over a over a particular period for example if we bought a property with a building on it we might put that in the non-current assets part of the balance sheet and then that would be depreciated over many years and that would feed back in up here but basically, for the free cash flow, we need to distinguish between what is long-term capex and what is short-term cash usage. So you can see here there's increase, decrease in, in inventories, there's increase, decrease, and everything looks like it's bouncing all over the place. That's okay. In the previous version of this video, what I did was I took the accountant's value of working capital, which is simply current assets minus current liabilities but a lot gets caught in between um, and it becomes a very blunt way of estimating what cash is being used in the short term. So you can see here that I got these figures from Woolworths' notes to accounting statements. Some investors might use current assets minus current liabilities as working capital, then get the change from one year to the next. Remember, it's the change that we're after. However, that method, i.e. using the balance sheet includes a number of non-operating items like short-term cash and or notes and debt plus non-cash items e.g. provisions so they're non-cash items a provision is a write down to the carrying value of assets don't get bogged down in that that's a discussion for next time but basically we want to focus on the true cash usage in the short term so accounts receivable um, what we're the, the crediting that we're taking advantage of, the, the accounts payable, uh, we want to focus on those items. And not so much things like cash or debt, which is used to finance the business. We just want to look at the operations, the operational cash flow. So a better way to calculate working capital is to focus on the operating assets that affect cash flow. In the US, where they use gap accounting, you can find this data at the start of the cash flow statement under the heading adjustments to operating assets. Outside of the US, like, a like in Australia, we need to search the annual report for something called a reconciliation of profit to cash flow. It should be in the notes. There will be a little table connecting the income statement or net income to cash flow, the cash flow from operations. Find the cash flow items and exclude non-regular items, e.g. provisions. And this is where it gets tricky. Remember, First, understand the cash flow item. So what are we actually looking at? For example, trade payables. A trade payable is, say, Woolworths getting some supplies and it has an account with that supplier and it says to the supplier, well, I'm not going to pay you for 30 days because I'm your only customer and I'm the biggest supermarket in Australia, so you'll just have to deal with it. So if Woolworths takes advantage of its trade payables, meaning it says to the supplier, we're going to increase how long it takes for me to pay you. What they're actually doing is they're holding on to cash, so they're benefiting from that. They take the, the item from the supplier 
and they don't have a cash outlay. So that's a benefit to Woolworths. So we, we need to understand what item we're talking about, but also then the direction of cash, e.g. an increase in trade payables. So what you see on the, the financial statements, an increase in, trades, in trade payables increases cash flow because a trade payable is an asset. Excuse that background noise if you can hear it. It is my coffee machine. How unprofessional. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So if you're confused about this, please just Google calculating working capital capital for DCF and you'll find some great tutorials. Or you can head to our website and I'll likely, up, likely upload a video in the near future. So raskfinance.com. Basically, you need to understand what we're dealing with. Is it an asset? Is it a cash flow asset? like a trade payable, or is it a, trust, a cash flow liability, such as accounts receivable? Okay, I'm going to show you exactly where this comes from and how easy it can be to get through this section. So we go into the annual report and we can go reconcile, searching for it, reconciliation, here we go we have the reconciliation of profit to cash. And you can see here that there's some adjustments for mostly uh, non-cash items. So there we have depreciation and amortization. So that's there. We have put option liability. Um, I don't know what that is, but I don't think it's cash flow. Um, impairment of non-financial assets. So an impairment is typically non-cash. Share-based payments expense. So that's for issuing shares to perhaps employees. Profit and loss on disposal of business. Remember that I'm not interested in that because it's not necessarily part of the core business. Interest capitalized, don't need to worry about that. Net profit or loss on the disposal and write-off of property, plant and equipment, don't need to worry about that. Dividends received, I don't think that's part of Woolworths core supermarket or retailing business, so I'm going to ignore that. Other, don't even know what that is, but that's fine, it's a very small item. This is the part where we should be interested. So you can see here, Woolworths has provided a breakout of all of the items that may lead to a, may lead to a change in cash flow. The I've copied that in here. The one thing that I haven't copied across is this item here, an increase or decrease in provisions. And you can see down the bottom here, it says includes restructuring owners onerous contracts and store exit costs. I don't think that they are a reliable or recurring um, item going forward. And a lot of them may not be cash flow, um, may not be cash flow items. So the restructuring cost is typically, you know, that may be a short, there may be a short term cash flow there, but for the sake of this video, I've, I've excluded it and I'm not gonna go, I won't go into detail with it, but if you did some research and you discovered that this was a cash flow item or part of it was cash flow and it was likely to recur, you might want to model that out and add some more detail to your, your DCF or your free cash flow. I haven't. I've simply said it's most likely not a cash flow item. Other items that you might say are not cash flow, there may be changes in tax assets or there may be changes in tax payable. But if you think about it, if you have a tax asset, it means that you've, it most, most likely means that you've paid cash ahead of time. And if you have income tax payable in the future, it means you probably put off tax for a while and you've received a cash flow benefit from that. So I've simply brought this across into our valuation model here to get the change in working capital. So what is this saying? You can see here that we have 931.2 million dollars of positive working change in working capital. So this positive change in working capital tells us Woolworths benefited by using less cash in working capital. Notice it benefited from a decrease in inventory spending. You can see that at the top here. So decrease, that's a positive number. Just keep note of the bracket, uh, the brackets and non-brackets. So it's a it's decreased its spending on inventory by 367 million. And that's most likely, you're probably saying to yourself, that's most likely because it closed its hardware business. And you're probably right. 
It may have also done some cost efficiencies and got rid of some items that it doesn't like spending money on. So notice it benefited from a decrease in inventory spending and increasing its trades payables position, meaning it took longer to pay its bills, which equals good for its cash flow. So you see that there, it has reversed from the year before. It's lent on, or it's elbowed its supplies and said, hey, we're not gonna pay you for a little bit longer. No worries. Um, and we have a positive outcome down the bottom here. In previous years, its working capital position, it's, it's had to invest a little bit more into its working capital position, but now it's got a lot less. Going forward, I've assumed that it continues to lean on um, its suppliers, it, you know, it makes investments in inventory, but not as much as, uh, it makes less investment inventory, but not as much as it has in the past. So I've done a very, very simple model here, just put in $100 million for change in working capital, but you might disagree with that. Um, if you go back 10 years, you might find that there's some obvious patterns in how much it's spending relative to say revenue. Um, a more accurate way to forecast than what I did here is to take the change in working capital as a percentage of the change in revenue. So you could say, um, how, much do you, how much did it invest in working capital versus how much did it get back in revenue for that period? Um, you might also just take a simple percentage of revenue. So you might say that this percent as a percent of revenue and then take an average over a number of years and model that forwards. Have I missed anything yet? Yeah. So obviously my model is just the simplest model and just forecast $100 million of working capital uh, benefit going forward. Okay, so now we have, all we have to do is simply follow the formula from above, which is right here, and get to free cash flow. So you'll see the formula is played out here, all the way across, like that. Now, if you get a free cash flow figure that's different to what you might see in an analyst report, that's okay. Just remember how you justified it, how you got to that position, why you put in inputs that you did, and make sure that they're actually realistic or as best as they can be. Because you, anyone can make a valuation model spit out an answer that they want, but actually modeling reality is very difficult. In fact, it, some would say it's even impossible. Okay, so we've got our free cash flow here. That's copied down here into the forecast period. So these years, these forecast periods, line up with the forecast years up here. So the way free cash flow and DCF valuations work is that we forecast it for a particular period and then we say, what happens after that? So we say, this is what we believe free cash flow is going to be over the next five years. And then we have to get the value of everything after that. So what happens for the rest of time after that? So you can see here, this uses the perpetuity method. So we're saying this goes on, Woolworths from this point on will grow forever. And you, you might be saying to yourself, well, that sounds like pretty simplistic, and it is. So this is what we call the terminal growth rate. You can see it here. If you click into the formula, you'll see that we have the final forecast period cash flow divided by the discount rate, which is here, the weighted average cost of capital, which we have pulled in from the earnings power value sheet or method down the bottom here. And we minus the terminal growth rate. So the terminal growth rate is what we believe the company will be valued at, or what the company's cash flows from five years until infinity and beyond. As Buzz Lightyear would say, what are those cash flows worth? Now, if we, if we increase the terminal growth rate, you would expect that value to go up, right? And it does, it goes up dramatically. How I pick, how I picked 3% for Woolworths going forward is I've said that its cash flow grows from the fifth year onwards at 3% because that's probably what inflation will be. Groceries aren't gonna go up that quick. They're not gonna grow at 5%. They might grow up at 4%. They might grow, go, grow at 2% a year, but inflation, I have assumed, you know, they grow just probably just ahead of what inflation would be, which is 3%. So that's how I've got to this final value. All that we do from that point is get the net present value. So this is just the time value of money formula, 
You simply get the cash flow, divide it by one plus the discount rate, which is the weighted average cost of capital, pulled in from the other spreadsheet, um, and the, the period. So obviously the further you get out into the future, the more it's discounted. So that just carries on all the way, and we do the terminal value as well. Next step is to put all those cash flows together. Remember, the discounted cash flow is we're taking the, the, the discounted value of all cash flow in the future periods, and we're summing it together, which is there. We subtract debt, and this comes from another spreadsheet which we did, um, which focused on the balance sheet. So it's got $3.03 billion of debt. We add back cash. So this is the enterprise value, the value of the whole company. Remember, when I said at the very start of this video, we are focusing on debt and equity holders. So you can see there we've added back cash and we've minus debt. This is all added, added back in to get the total value of the company here, which is $26.646 uh, billion. Dollars rather. So that's the value of the company as a whole. Divided by the number of shares gives us a valuation of $20.42 according to our discounted cash flow analysis. Okay, let's just backpedal on a few things and before we do one last thing that we need to do. Using this model here, we can do a bit of a fact check on ourselves. We can say, okay, we've done all the work, we've forecast cash flow out into the future, and from that point on, we say the company's going to be the company's cash flow is going to be worth $32.49 billion. We can use another method. We can use another sorry, another method to fact check what we're doing. So if we say that the forecast value of cash flow, the forecast value of EBITDA in the future. That 3279 comes from up here, 3279 in 2022. We can say shareholders may spend approximately 10 times, may be willing to pay 10 times EBITDA in 2022 for the company. So that would give us a value of around about $32.79 billion, which is slightly above what we've assumed with the cash flow value. Or you could say that um, the EBIT. They will, they'll be willing to pay seven times EBIT, which the reality is it should be the other way around, seven times EBIT, which would give us a terminal value of that. This could just be a fact check on what you believe the company is worth in the future. So you could say, you could compare this value to say the value of the company down here and just get a rough idea of whether what you forecast is reasonable or not. If I've confused you a little bit here, that's okay, don't worry, because there are plenty other ways to fact check what the company uh, will be worth in the future. Remember that our tutorials on relative valuation, you can forecast the profit and then the price earnings ratio into the future to get a reasonableness, to do a reasonableness test on your, your DCF. But that's just a, what we might call, that's somewhat of an exit multiple. So what are we planning to exit with in the future? You'll hear that tossed around investment banking circles every now and again. So quick summary of what we've done. We arrived at sales revenue by estimating what we believe sales were at across each of the different businesses or segments. We then used margins to forecast what EBIT will be in the future. We estimated depreciation and amortization. We've given it a tax rate of 30%. We've estimated how much the company is going to invest in long-term spending and how much it will have to spend in short-term capital to get to free cash flow. Then we took the free cash flow and we put it here and we estimated what the company's future free cash flow would be worth in the terminal value. And we adjusted, remember we could adjust with different growth rates, we could even say it grows negatively, but I won't do that. Well, that wouldn't be growing negatively, it would just be shrinking. Um, and then we've taken the present value of them, put it into this simple table here, taken away debt that would be paid to debt holders, added back cash that w the company holds, and we have a value for the shares in the future, for a value for the shares based on what we expected to do in the future. The number of shares are that many, which means that the valuation is that. Put that back to three. So there's our valuation. The final thing to do to round out this valuation series is put that value back into the beginning here. There we go. 
So our discounted cash flow valuation is $20.42. I'm giving that a weighting of 60%. You can see that I've tweaked, if you've been following along with our other valuation tutorials, you can see that I've tweaked some of the weightings there. I think DCF is probably the most robust, even though we didn't go into too much detail with our forecasts. You can see here that um, I've given it a, a higher weighting because I have more faith in that valuation methodology. But you might use some of these other valuation methodologies and think that they are worth a higher weighting. So you can do that, but just be mindful that they should add to 100. If you hover over that, you can see down the bottom right hand corner, it says 100. So what is this all telling us? After we've done all of our valuations, we have a weighted valuation of $20.50. And that's compared to the current market price of $31.37. Obviously, our valuation is much further below the current market price. And there's a few takeaways from this. We could have made a mistake in our valuation, which is very possible. We may be underestimating the true intrinsic value, or Woolworths could simply be overpriced. This all comes back to what you believe the company will do in the future, and what do you believe those assets that it owns are worth? Remember, this margin of safety concept is that um, we're saying it's 53% overvalued. If Woolworths valuation came out at $40, we would say we have a margin of safety of 22%. Well, that takes us to the end of the valuation series, the value of everything. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Head to raskfinance.com or find me on Twitter, at Owen Rask. This spreadsheet can be downloaded from our website. If you navigate there, you'll find a button that says download the spreadsheet, and you'll come back to this page. Just hit file and download as. Download it as an Excel, Microsoft Excel. Um, and then if you have a Google Drive account, you could drag it into your Google Drive, and then the formulas that automatically pull in data from Google Finance would work. Otherwise, you may have to go through and update some of the, the yellow um, cells that do not automatically feed in. Okay, I really hope you enjoyed the valuation series. We'll likely be adding more content on valuation in the near future to our website, and it's all free, of course. So head on over, and if you have any questions, be sure to email me. Thanks, and cheers to our financial futures.